This man is considered one of America's deadliest hitmen. He gained a chilling notoriety by claiming to be an enforcer for Mexican drug cartels like the Sinaloa Cartel and Los Cetas. His menacing nickname, El Mano Negra, the Black Hand, signified his alleged role as a remorseless killer in the dark, violent world of narco trafficking. Imagine dumping a victim's corpse in acid, a trademark tactic of the cartels he worked for, or shooting a man point blank simply for parking in the wrong driveway. These were just routine hits for him over his 30-year reign of terror. When he was finally apprehended, he stunned authorities by calmly confessing to over 50 murders himself, revealing harrowing details only the perpetrator could know. So who was this enigmatic criminal mastermind? How did a humble farm worker's son from California's neglected migrant communities build and manage such a vast murder-for-hire syndicate? How did the Black Hands organization operate undetected within the shadowy criminal underworld for so long, extending its reach across multiple U.S. states? And what finally led to the dramatic downfall of this prolific hired killer after decades of evading justice? Today, we're pulling back the curtain on the double life of the man called El Mano Negra. From his first steps towards a life of violence to his ultimate capture, this is the untold true story of America's deadliest hitman and how he climbed to the upper ranks of organized crime before his empire finally came crumbling down. Some 62 years ago, the now convicted serial killer was born. You know that feeling of joy every parent has when they have a new baby. That's just how his parents felt. To them, they had a cute, innocent-looking baby. Who could have thought that the child was a terror yet to be discovered? He spent his formative years in Erlemart, a Tulare County in California town, a tightly woven farm worker community with records of violence between gangsters and drug pushers that earned the moniker Murder Mart. At that time, drug trade was prevalent in this community. It was seventh on the list of counties with the highest rate of homicide. Unknown to many, the town plays a key role in the movement of drugs and the accompanying transit of guns and money in the United States. It was, in fact, a farm team for fearsome drug cartels in Mexico. One such cartel is Los Zitas, notorious for its bloody tactics. It also had the habit of dumping murder victims in acid. At other times, it would publicly display bodies hanging from bridges. A high-ranking member of the vicious cartel named Jose Maria Guizar Valencia was eventually arrested in Mexico City. Ismael Zambada Garcia was another powerful leader of one cartel known as the Sinaloa Cartel. On the good side, about 40% of the fruits and nuts grown in the U.S. are harvested in this community and other nearby towns. So this community may have started as one of the centers of commerce. Unfortunately, it became a shadow of itself. Isolated, dusty settlements, few grocery stores, lack of shelter for migrant workers, and the like. In 2011, an investigator called it the poorest county in California after visiting the community. In the real sense, it is the second poorest county. Growing up in such an isolated town far from the radar of law enforcement agencies tends to impact a child's behavior, at least negatively. And that's just what happened with the man in question. As a diligent business person would do, this man took his time to understand elements critical to his success as a hitman. He knew the peculiarity of his community and the kind of people he should kill. Basically, his community was full of poor people and undocumented immigrants who were either afraid to speak up for fear of being deported or had no one to speak for them. In fact, it wouldn't be out of place to conclude that some of the immigrants may be criminals themselves or who goes to a community other than theirs and avoids being documented if not someone with an ulterior motive. That's just by the way. The man in question is Jose Manuel Martinez, one of America's bloodiest hitmen. To show his prowess in killing, Martinez was nicknamed El Mano Negra, which translates as the Black Hand. He worked as a gun for hire, collecting debts and killing people across the United States. Apart from that, he also killed a lot of people just because they got him angry. Apart from being born in Tulare County, Martinez and his siblings also spent part of their childhood in the remote town of Sierra Madre in Mexico. 
In California, his mother and stepfather were in charge of managing housing for migrant farm workers, which was an epic battle in the 20th century. Martinez's stepfather, Pedro Fernandez, was responsible for lining up work crews for grape growers. But he also did business, the heroin business. And since Martinez didn't like farm work, he had to do the other work. So his stepfather introduced him to drugs. As a bilingual, it was easy for Martinez to move between worlds easily. In the spring of 1976, his stepfather sent him to Indio to pick up a package for him. It turned out to be heroin. He was a kid, after all, and didn't know much about it. Upon his return to the United States, he enrolled in an elementary school, but he faced great humiliation from his colleagues as he couldn't speak English. It wasn't long before he dropped out of school. According to him, he didn't realize how important education was. At that point, he had nothing to do except venture fully into the business his stepfather bequeathed. So he got a 1969 yellow Ford Galaxy car to allow him to move heroin and, by extension, pick up girls. In 1977, when he was 15, he met his wife, whom he would later live with for the next 10 years. That same year, the Drug Enforcement Administration raided Martinez a ranch, seizing $2.5 million worth of drugs and several firearms. He, his stepfather, and a few others were arrested. But a couple of years later, they were released. It wasn't long before a tragedy struck. Martinez's sister, Cecilia, was murdered, and her body was dumped near a beach. She had followed a man there, and now she was dead. Martinez would later accompany his mother to file a complaint with the Riverside County Sheriff, who promised to investigate the open homicide. Rather than await investigations into the murder case, he assumed the position of an investigator. According to him, he found out who her late sister's boyfriend and his associates were. He simply killed the three individuals against his father's warning to him to let God take care of them. He dumped their bodies in unmarked graves. In all of these, Martinez touted himself as a nice man until his sister was killed. To him, killing the people who he believed murdered his sister was a feeling so good. He vowed never to give up the location of the three bodies as he felt their bones didn't deserve to be found. In 1980, Martinez was hanging out with his friends when one of his friends told him his sister had been raped. The friend gave the location of the alleged rapist as the farm town of Lindsay, California, where he's living with his wife and young son. Martinez was just 18 then. He didn't hesitate and promised to help him for $500 which he described as point and shoot easy money. Martinez and his friend went after David Bedalla, who was heading to pick up workers to help him pick grapes. They trailed his little yellow car down country roads as he picked up workers along the way. Just as he got to the vine where the group would be working, Martinez fired a 22 caliber gun, hitting Bedalla in the head such that he died on the spot. In September 1982, while Martinez was at his Erlemart home, he was visited by a friend. While reminiscing the past, the friend told him about a fight that broke out three years earlier in a dance hall shooting in a small town in the Sierra Madres, which left four people dead. According to him, one of those killed was Martinez's distant relative. Interested in the case, Martinez asked about those responsible for the shootout. He learned the location of two of them. One named Silvestri Aon was living in Santa Barbara County. Martins wasted no time and set out with three other men to find Aon. Luckily, he found him driving a tractor on a ranch and opened fire on him, killing him instantly. He got $2,500 from one of the men he later identified as Mr. X. Two weeks later, Mr. X brought another offer. He was having an issue with a man who owed him $95,000. Martinez tracked the debtor down and brought him to an empty garage. He gave him a window of two hours to pay the money. Interestingly, the debtor provided the money, and Martinez drove the cash straight to Mr. X, who rewarded him with $30,000 for his troubles. The money he got from Mr. X constituted the largest reward he ever got from his hitman business, apart from the smuggling business in which he was engaged. 
In both endeavors, his greatest asset was confidence. There was a time when he was pulled over by an officer en route to Chicago. The officer threatened to bring dogs to search Martinez's car. Rather than panic and plead with the officer, he smiled at him and even offered to help with the search. His calm demeanor made the officer skip the search. However, he had 10 kilos of cocaine in his search. One thing would have happened if the search had been carried out. He could have probably killed the officer or got arrested. According to him, his expertise as an assassin was self-taught. He had learned from movies, especially the Rambo series, not to get nervous, to be patient, and not to leave evidence. All of these were the hallmarks of his operations. Martinez, who was married twice and had a child with a woman he was having an affair with, earned a lot of money from his illegal businesses. His daughter once said he didn't really care about money. She said he often gave money away as soon as he made it, helping those in need and, of course, taking care of his family. What an irony. There have been some instances where Martinez combined acts of violence with a small dose of empathy. On one occasion, he shot a man named Domingo Perez just because he parked in his mother's driveway, despite several warnings. A woman had accidentally hit his son while pulling out of the driveway in 1995. Although his son wasn't hurt, Martinez forbade anyone from parking there. Unfortunately, Perez parked there three times, and when Martinez confronted him, he gave him an answer he considered disrespectful. After killing the man, he secretly returned his car to the man's family's home. Days passed without the sight of Perez. Martinez overheard Perez's mother's cry and got emotional too. So he retrieved the corpse from where he kept it and moved it to a more visible spot. At least the deceased mother would bring some peace of mind upon seeing his son's corpse. Some weeks after the murder of David Bedalla, the Tulare County Sheriff's Office got a call. Homicide detective Ralph Diaz answered the call and carefully wrote down the caller's name. The caller made some remarkable references to the killing, which he described as revenge for a stabbing during a card game. It turned out that the caller identified himself as Martinez. Although Martinez confessed to the murder years later, he denied making the call. But going by his history of killings, the police suspected he could be the killer. Still, he was never charged with murder. Martinez's most recent operation was the killing of Drakken Berrigan in Erlemart in September 2009. While investigating the death, the police discovered that the deceased had been threatened by a person known as El Mono Negre. They immediately knew it was Martinez. After all, that's his nickname. They also found a woman who claimed Martinez considered hiring her to lure Berrigan to an isolated place. Before that time, Martinez had outstanding warrants for a parole violation and auto theft. Although he was arrested on a parole violation, he managed to swallow the CIM card retrieved from one of his phones, so officers couldn't get to see his text messages. Martinez spent a few months in jail for the parole violation, but the murder remained unsolved. Anyone who takes a stroll across the streets of Rickgrove, the hamlet where Martinez and his family lived for many years, would easily come across people who know him. To some, he was a dedicated family man who was always ready to lend a helping hand to his mother. To another, he was a friendly figure, rendering humanitarian services to his neighbors. And some claimed they heard that he was a contract killer by the name El Mano Negra. But none was surprised that the police didn't get him. After all, the city has no law. In Rickgrove, there have been several complaints of crimes that were not responded to. Some speculated it was because most of the victims were people of no great value. Despite a lot of witnesses against Martinez, there was no physical evidence of his involvement in the killings. He was described as a good liar, so there was little anyone could do. Yet he never stopped his killing spree. Sometimes, the Tulare sheriffs would think Martinez dared them to catch him. Following his release from prison on his parole violation in March 2010, he went straight to the Violent Crimes Division of the Tulare County Sheriff's Office to retrieve his Chevy Suburban. It had been seized after he was questioned about Barangan's murder. He would later offer to reveal what he knew about the murder. 
There, he suggested to police that he was a collector for a Guadalajara-based drug cartel. He went further to tell the police that Berrigan was only murdered because he was a rat and not because he owed money. But he feigned ignorance of the murder repeatedly. The police couldn't take the case further as there was no ground to charge him. So they let him go. But it wasn't long before luck ran against him. Javier Horta, a masonry contractor and drug pusher, had been accused of stealing 10 kilos of cocaine from another drug distributor. Martinez was hired to retrieve the debt. To his utmost surprise, the target was only 20 years old. Martinez watched him for a few days and avoided picking him up in the presence of his young daughter. So he pretended to be a homeowner who needed masonry work and was looking for an estimate. Huerta showed up to bid on the job, and Martinez kidnapped him, forcing him to hand over approximately $200,000 in cash. Then he shot him and one of his co-workers, leaving their bodies to rot in an abandoned Nissan truck. Immediately, the police knew it was a drug hit. They heard the complete story of the stolen cocaine and the money. But they needed to find out who ordered the hit and carried it out. After carrying out the operation, Martinez left for his daughter's house in Alabama. Coincidentally, it was his granddaughter's birthday. He drove her to a toy store and got a lot of gift items for her. Back in Florida, where detectives were investigating the murder of Horta, they found a Mountain Dew can in the center console of Horta's truck, emptied it, and found a cigarette butt. They sent it off to the crime lab for testing. Although the evidence was initially abandoned for some time with no analysis, some detectives opened the case and asked the Florida Department of Law Enforcement to run the search. Unaware of any search into his activities and possible involvement in the murder of Horta, Martinez returned to Alabama in the winter of 2013 to visit his divorced daughter and, by extension, granddaughters. He'd pick up his granddaughters from school and play with them for hours. Obviously, he was the only father figure his granddaughters had at that time. Martinez offered to help his daughter establish her own roofing business, but his daughter wouldn't allow him to. According to her, he was not covered under her insurance. After a while, Martinez found a way to help her. He met with Jose Ruiz, a friend of her daughter's former boyfriend. Ruiz had a debt to reclaim for his business. He considered that an opportunity to lend his expertise and get Ruiz to tell him more about the man his daughter was in a relationship with. Not knowing Martinez or his daughter, Ruiz described his friend's girlfriend as a bitch and terrible mother, an action that enraged Martinez. Martinez vowed to get him killed, but he had to take his time. Ruiz and Martinez had been seen together, and Ruiz also had his DNA all over Martinez's car. So Martinez left for his mother's home in California. Unfortunately, he couldn't get over Ruiz's comments. Remember the forgotten cigarette butt? The lab report eventually came out, and it matched that of a man once held in a Californian prison. Jose Manuel Martins of Ritgrove, California. We must realize that the victim had driven different workers and clients to job sites, and the cigarette butt could have belonged to any of them. But considering that the one whose DNA matched that of the cigarette butt was a suspected serial murderer, there was enough reason to assume that Martinez could be the murderer. A few weeks after returning to Alabama, Martinez found a pretext to ride with Ruiz and his daughter's boyfriend, Jane Romero. He suggested that they drive into the Bankhead National Forest. As they pulled over next to a hayfield, he pulled out a gun and shot at Ruiz, who he accused of bad-mouthing his daughter. He returned to the car and asked the startled Romero to drive off. Although Martinez shot Ruiz in a remote field where it might be impossible to discover his body for a long time, some nearby hunters heard the shots and visited the scene. They later invited the police, who arrived at the scene, to have preliminary checks. Martinez returned to California at the home where his sons lived. Local police arrived at his door. Citing them, he ran away. But Tulare County Sheriff's Deputy Crystal Darrington gave him a good chase and was eventually caught. One would think Martinez was about to get arrested for the Alabama killing, but that's not the case. He was actually being investigated as a felon in possession of ammunition in the broader investigation of a series of violent 
drug-related robberies. The cops cuffed him and took him away. At that point, Darrington learned from a colleague that the arrested fellow was El Mano Negra, the man rumored to be a hired assassin. She found it difficult to believe that such a cool man with pleasant hair and wry humor could be involved in serial killing. While taking him to the station, Durrington told Martins about the robberies. He got emotional at the point of hearing about a young woman who was threatened with gang rape. You'd remember his late sister suffered a similar fate, and it was that moment he began his career as a serial killer. Rather than get him locked up for illegal possession of ammunition, Authorities freed him after he promised to help them solve lesser crimes. Unfortunately, Martinez escaped to Mexico. Mexico is known to shield people accused of murder, especially when there is the likelihood that they face life imprisonment or death as a penalty. Could it be that Martinez has escaped prosecution and his killing spree would continue? Let's get going. As the search to solve the circumstances surrounding Ruiz's death continued, Officers found a Walmart receipt close to his body. They got to the store, and one of the surveillance cameras revealed images of Romero, Ruiz's friend, who was dating Martinez's daughter. Another footage revealed a truck pulling up next to Ruiz's truck not long before the murder. Running the license plate, they discovered it belonged to Romero. Without further investigation, they were certain Romero perpetrated the act. So they traced him to Martinez's daughter's house. Martinez's daughter dismissed the claim that her father was probably a contract killer. But she was quite aware that he was a criminal who smuggled people across the U.S.-Mexico border. Against her father's attempt to get her to join the U.S. Border Patrol to help his smuggling business, the daughter chose a different path. She watched as her boyfriend was taken away on murder charges. But in a twist of events, Martinez went to the police and made an alibi for Romero. He vowed that Romero was with him at the time of the murder. But the alibi didn't work. A month after Romero's arrest, the murder charges were still hanging over him. He then requested to speak with one of the officers. And since he couldn't speak English and only spoke Spanish, a high school football coach and Spanish teacher were invited. Romero told them that the killer was actually the man who came to vouch for him, his girlfriend's father, Jose Martinez. The officer was convinced Martinez could be the murderer. Unfortunately, he was surprised to learn that Martinez was already in Mexico. Interestingly, Martinez returned to the United States and got arrested for murder. He was jailed in Yuma, Arizona. Despite his arrest, Martinez seemed unconcerned. To their utmost surprise, Martinez confessed to killing Ruiz. He would later confess to other murders, too. He told the detectives that he willingly confessed because he had decided that it was time to pay for his deeds. He also didn't like that his daughter was being interrogated. He went further to provide details of all the crimes he had committed, including the ones that were 30 years old. From the locations of the killings to the kind of cars he was driving, the caliber of bullets, and even the shell casings, such details could only be known by the one who actually perpetrated the act. Police were both amazed by the killings and the quality of his memory. Justifying the killings, Martinez claimed his victims had hurt women or children in one way or the other, though he couldn't provide proof. All efforts to get him to name the people he worked for or with didn't yield results. From his jail cell in Florida, Martinez sent many letters to his granddaughters and other family members. The letters contained advice that could make a good parenting book and a series of topics that could be discussed from a church pulpit. All this while, Martinez's daughter had thought her father was a mechanic. Despite cooling his feet off in a Florida jail, Martinez's granddaughters see him as a funny, loving, storytelling, and caring grandfather, and not a serial killer. To his daughter, Martinez's confession was a gesture toward redemption. Eventually, Martinez's confession helped to close several old murder cases. Altogether, he has pleaded guilty to 12 murders, nine in California, one in Alabama, and two in Florida, although all of these are not even close to half of the total number of killings Martinez has claimed to have carried out. In Alabama, he was sentenced to 50 years in prison in March 2013. In California, life in prison without parole in October 2015. 
and in the June 2019 trial in Florida, he bagged two consecutive life sentences. And that's the end of the video of the man with two sides, the human and the monster sides. If you found the story interesting, kindly like and share the video. And don't forget to subscribe for more videos.